<laughs> Alright, you're up. You good? Yep. Okay. So obviously I think you guys can read the title. It's pretty it's pretty uh, you know, right smack in the middle. That's my name, that's my company, or a flow north, and that's today's day. So so um, yeah, this this was kind of a last minute topic. Uh, I, I, I think I had like two other possible topics that I could have that I could have like done, but but um, but apparently JP sent something to the list and and uh, I, I could not respond to it in some form, and and so that that's basically his his original entire original email, and I know, it's a I know it's a little bit small, I didn't run format or anything, and neither did JP, so that's literally verbatim, as it's formatted, except for maybe it matters, but, and, but yeah, he basically just posted uh, these three, three little articles about, you know, BSD on some sort of a desktop or a, or a laptop environment, and this talk is mostly going to cover the first one. It may brush upon the other two, but it's really about the first one because when I originally replied to this email, like I, I, I apparently I, I was like in the middle of like just writing this this long, long reply, and I was like, wait, why, why don't we just give a talk on it? Because apparently we haven't we haven't had well we haven't really had like desktop ish talk in quite a while. I I think I, I, I think the last time last time it was anything desktop related was. I think back in, it was a plug sector one time and it was like three of us talking about window managers, something like that. So, so you know, I mean, me, per and so with this kind of an email, this kind of little provocative email here, uh, it, it was almost bait. It was almost just topic bait right there, so. So, thanks JP. And, yeah, so challenge accepted. Um, so the, the the challenge I'm referring to was is from the the author of the first uh, the, the first bullet point, the 2019 uh, blog post by this German guy. And uh, in his blog post, he had actually referenced a tweet he had sent back in February. You guys can give that a little a little read right there. And yeah, so this was so he referenced this tweet in in like I think the second or third paragraph of that 2019 April blog post. Yeah. Question: Is it Mac OS already star VSD? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so how is that moving away? <laughs> uh, so well, o only only the Darwin portion is actually VSD. The, okay. like Aqua okay. and everything else is is. is uh, is that one uh, cultivar of fruit? So, <laughs> so real. So when so yeah, Mac OS in this in, in this instance not necessarily referring to the Darwin part. It's really referring to the Aqua and everything else. And uh, and if anyone has kind of seen or, or really gone to like a developers conference or even just seen just technical you know news articles or or, or technical media, it's very possible that. You would like if it's like a crowd, if it's like a picture of a crowd or something like that. These days, you might you might see like ninety five percent of the people in that crowd. You know, it's almost like they have like every every one of them has like a lighter, like like a bic in the audience. But like but but the bic in, instead of the bic, it's it's a particular cultivar of fruit that I grows off the like, tree. I feel like targeted. I don't know. You feel like targeted? I know Keith's enjoying this one. So, so, yes, challenge, challenge accepted from this tweet this guy posted in February. And, of course, it cannot fail worse than Windows 98. I got that from BSD Canvas Pass here because, because why not? So, so this talk, you know, besides, you know, besides me kind of like describing, you know, the, like the setup of a BSD or Linux desktop. This is also kind of a talk for, for for those who may be a little bit on the evangelist side of things. You know, those who may may have a little bit of a fanboyish tendency, or who just otherwise think that you know 
their best tool for the job, which might be a Linux or a BSD desktop, is should be should be like you know a little bit more a little bit more popular than them seeing seeing those other laptops all the time. So in order to really go there, we have to discuss we have to discuss the concept of freedom. And there are multiple, and in fact, I'm going to discuss exactly three different types of freedom that pertain to this. To, to this case, you know, to using tools, to using technology, what have you. So, first freedom is uh, is free as in free beer. There's me and George, you know, enjoying our free beer on some random Thursday, and that's that's kind of the that's kind of the the concept of like, hey, you can you can go on some website that is the home of some open source project that more often than not you can just download the source code or, or if they provide a binary you can download the binary for free as in free beer. So and most I would say like most everyone here and most everyone else in the open source community is familiar with this kind of a concept because you know pretty central to it in most cases. So that's free as in free beer. This is free as in free speech. Free as in free speech is, it tends to be a little bit more geared towards you know those who may follow the um, follow like the the GNU culture with the GPL and the copy left and all that stuff. You know the freedom to the the freedom to like really you know contribute back you know put something out there and then you can do whatever you want with it to an extent. So. Most people, most people are going to be familiar with the free as in free speech as well. So, we have the first two of three freedoms that are going to be discussed here, kind of covered. Most people tend to tend to understand it. The third one is a little bit. It might, some people may not may not even think of, you know. But I think anyone who anyone who's probably in a business setting, probably in like a really hurried business setting. Will um, will probably experience it, but probably not able to articulate it the best. And that's free as in free time. And clearly, we can see that's like that's part of the office's old uh, menu because I couldn't find a picture of a clock because I was lazy. But but apparently, I took a picture of the office's menu. So and of course, there's the word overtime in there. So free as in free time is a little bit more about just the just the overall even contributing to open source in general, you know, and contributions to open source can really take multiple different forms, but it's usually in the forms of you know source code, documentation, testing, dog fooding, what have you there, and all of whatever way besides I guess payment uh, you, you choose to contribute to open source, uh, it takes time and. Time is, everyone kind of gets the same amount of time to do certain things, it's just everyone prioritizes different things. And for kind of the evangelists or the fanboys or the such out there, you know, they may not, they may not be thinking of this third freedom when they're evangelizing like why people aren't using Linux desktops or whatever their chosen tool of like tool of choice because to the other person they they may be used to some other tool or perhaps they've actually tried said tool of choice but it took them forever to really get it together and so they're just like alright fuck it I'm not using this so that's free as in free time and, and it's really important to, that all three of these freedoms are kind of considered you know equally just because there, it, it's really an overarching theme in, in, in especially desktop selection, or really tool selection here. And big up Lewis Rossman, he actually, uh, Lewis Rossman's a uh, Mac, uh, MacBook repair guy up in New York City, uh, does a lot of YouTube videos of his repair, but he also rants about business and life and such, and he actually did a video specifically on you know the the three free the three freedoms, and it's it, it's a really great watch if you have the time to watch it. That is. Uh, 
So, uh, what people think of you know Unix or Linux or BSD or whatever on the desktop can take you know very wildly different, wildly different forms of imagination. And you know some people some people may really think the worst of everything. You know, so this was this was actually a previous plug north back when we were in the other room where we actually did a live stream once. And that's my, that's actually my Windows tablet, but at the time I didn't really, I, I didn't have like a, um, a tripod that I could mount the, mount the tablet vertically. And so brought like shoebox, binders, books, even a, uh, even, even an arm from a chair just to get it to balance correctly. But it kind of like, even though this is, this is a Windows Windows tablet, it kind of like encompasses some of what people think about like who've never used a who've never used like a Linux desktop before. So it kind of encompasses what those people may think when when they're going to go into the rabbit hole of of, of of using a Linux desktop or a Unix desktop for the first time. They're like, oh, like I'm worried that like it's going to be a nightmare. Uh, I'm, I'm worried that it's going to it's going to take a lot of time to configure to my liking because because they're not expecting much out of the box, but that's one that's one example there. And I'm really ashamed that he's not here because that that really is the final meltdown in some ways. Um, but that's that's one embodiment there. The other one is that some people may some people think that the only way you can really effectively run a Unix or a Linux desktop is to use just really old hardware because because honestly it, it kind of does take a little bit in the open source world to support your hardware. To an extent, it's getting better, but the thought, like the lingering, the, the, the lingering thought, the lingering preconceptions of you, you really need to get old hardware to really use, you know, the, the, the Unix or the Linux desktops properly are, like, they, they still remain. Sometimes it can take extremes as, you know, you take a computer this old that still has a tape, uh, that still has a cassette drive in there, you know, for data storage, that kind of old. You know. I, I, I actually wanted to use the, the, the same picture that Bruce Momgen used, because he also used a, um, for, for one of his talks, it was, he was discussing software lifecycle and he used another Wang computer. Uh, picture just to discuss like sometimes the life cycle is very long sometimes it doesn't sometimes it just like it is a, it's a standstill but you know now now that we got you know all of those out of the way when you really think of when you really think of a, even a GUI but especially a desktop GUI you always have to consider function you know because you know if it doesn't function correctly, if, if you can't really do your work or whatever you want to do, like what, what use is a desktop really? Sure. Now, for, for most desktops, like you, you kind of have your, well, most people kind of have their own preconceptions of what a desktop should be, what it should do, all that stuff, but there's also the concept of like how it's presented. And yes, that, that is an and in the function and form. And I do remember, like, I do remember in a previous plug, uh, a, a guy who looks like this uh, d discussed this. Although he, although he disguised this topic in, in, in a topic in about like elephants, about some mythical elephant. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't really remember what what that mythical elephant was, but if he's here, like, you know. There's a very specific line that I remember you saying about it, about about the function and form. I, I actually remember this point. I, it's probably in, it's probably in that place, but, but go ahead. It's, it's form versus function. No, you no. I'm about to like no. You're supposed to say it. Damn it. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Should have shared the script with him before. So, yeah, but I, I, know, I know I know I'll be performing. <laughs> Too bad. So, this guy. This guy in that previous plug talk, uh, while he was discussing this function and form as, as part of you know as part of discussing some elephant topic, uh, he specifically said that 
Yes, function over form all day, every day, but form is not unimportant. Now can you expand on it? <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's, that's the point. Function, form is not unimportant. That, that was the subject point there. You're mixing two talks, that's why I was confused. <laughs> what the fuck was that? That, that thumbnail was, that was also a Plug North talk last year when he did, when he did the, um, when he did Linux and business, something like that, using yeah. Linux and, uh, mm -hmm. but, but, but no, like, th this thumbnail was, was just too good to not use. That's the, that's the thing. So, so, in, but wait, especially in, in a, in a graphical desktop, desktop, like, situation, yes, function and form are both important. Yes, you need the functions, but when you're, when you're dealing with, like, trying to get other people to use your tool or like maybe try to convince other people that another tool might be better for what they're doing, you also have, you, you've got to have the form in there to really sweeten the deal. You know, you know some, some, some people really do care about, you know, transparency or the swooshing around or some, or, or certain other things that some people may consider eye candy, but to them is, is, is part of the whole experience. So. Yeah, form is not unimportant here. Now, I forgot to mention in, in the very beginning that there, yes, there, there was a wishing to move away from Mac OS part. I can't really, I, I'm, I can't really speak to the best of my ability of the moving away from Mac OS part because I haven't used Mac OS as a daily driver since I graduated high school. Uh, but, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to try my best here uh, because I, I actually did do a little bit of research. Um, if I, because I almost didn't do any research on this one, but I, I did a little research before uh, while I was preparing these slides, and I actually found some interesting st statistics besides all the all the media articles and all the pictures of uh, of like, you know Apple Bix or something like that. So that wishing to move away from Mac OS part, you know, yeah, like could just be steeped in conf a lot of confirmation bias, but there's some. There, there's some statistics that that are truthful and some that kind of tell a different story. So let's take a look. So the reality, part part one of four actually. So this is from Stack Overflow's. So Stack Overflow does does an annual developer survey, and when I when I initially put together these slides, only the, only the 2018 survey was actually released and. I'm not sure if you guys can actually see the see the percentages properly or not, but hopefully you guys can see the lines for the for, for the different bars. But what we're looking at here is you know the specifically a section on developers' primary operating systems, like primary operating systems they use for software development, technology development, development, whatever, uh, because that's kind of what we're because that's I mean at the end of the day that's kind of what Linux and Unix and BSD desktops were kind of made for in a way, not necessarily, um, unless we're talking about elementary, but that's a different story. Not necessarily for like more casual people. So we're, we're just going to focus on just developers or other highly technical people in this case. So developers' primary operating systems from 2018, and this was from all uh, all the participants, because they actually they, they actually did split it between all participants and then just the ones who are actually, you know, employed or otherwise working in the industry, and um, and so what we're looking at is the all participants tab, and clearly we can see that Windows kind of dominates here. I think it's it, I think it's around like 49 or so percent in this from 2018. Mac OS, you know, is like, you know, it, it's like kind of half that, but then. What actually kind of surprised me in a way was that Linux, Linux was not far behind for Mac OS. It was not far behind. And, and, and that's all, like that, and that's including all variants and distros and desktop environments of Linux. And then of course at the, at the very bottom, which is not statistically significant, is BSD slash other Unices, which that's just going to be me and perhaps the open BSD people. And yeah, so yeah, so that. This result actually surprised me quite a bit, but that also that's also kind of encouraging because we're not doing so bad after all. 
If we look at professionals, the percentages don't really change much, and the participant numbers only dropped slightly. I mean, if you, if you just look at the bars, I mean, it's, nothing's really changed. You know, so, you can, so at least in this survey, you can really tell that almost everyone who actually took the survey is actually in the industry in some way and not just someone who's just doing it for doing it for fun but but you know does something else for for cash like Tom Colibus who's actually an anesthesiologist. You know? So this is the 2018 survey. Meanwhile, earlier today, Stack Overflow Stack Overflow released the 2019 results. Windows took a little bit of a dive compared to 2018. Windows took a little bit of a dive. Mac OS, you know, kind of stayed constant. But Linux gained some ground. Linux actually gained some ground. So Linux, so in 2018, Linux was around 23 or so percent. 2019, 25. 25%, 25 and then the BSDs dropped 0.1, and that's probably, I don't know. Whatever, it's, it's not statistically significant there. And if we look at if we look at the professional one, the percentages have not changed either. So again, you know, almost everyone who takes a survey is actually working in the industry in some in, in some form. Uh, something else that actually for, that I probably should have included like after this slide with regards to Stack Overflow survey was actually how they how they chose how how they chose you know the, the responsive survey. Or, or, or really how they um, how they blasted out the survey for people to actually respond to, and I I just took a very very quick peek at at even those statistics, and the vast majority um, vast majority by a little bit of the of the response were actually European. They're, they're, they're from Europe, followed by North America, and then I forget the rest. But <clears throat> Europe, so that might skew things a little bit in favor of Linux. It might skew things a little bit in favor of Linux because Europe, Europe's a little bit more. Um, Europe cares a little bit more about this, about like about making sure that they run open source, open source stuff, things like that. So the fact that like it was mostly Europeans responding to this may skew things, but in any case, the methodology that I kind of skimmed through it, that how they did it. Pretty much will pretty much eliminates confirmation bias. So, you know, like because pictures pictures might not tell you everything. So. Now, so we got that out of the way. Now, when you're when you're actually going to promote or even develop for or even just use use a um, use an operating system, well. Specifically, a Linux or BSD or some other Unix system with a desktop, you know, develop for it. You really need to eat your own dog food, you know, like especially if you're going to like if you're going to show show your environment off. Even even when it's like when you, even when you're at a users group like this, you're sitting at tables and you're just kind of like doing a Q and A or just messing around like we usually do. And someone walks over. A little bit curious because because it's a little bit different than what they're used to. For example, like back when I actually ran Monte on this machine, you know, some people would actually come by my laptop and see like, oh wait, what desktop are you running? And it's like, dude, it's Monte, one free BSD. And it's like, it's like, oh, never seen it before. And so they, they think it's cool. There's no one because you never seen it before. And what's even better is that I'm I'm using it myself. You know, I'm testing things, reporting bugs, fixing bugs. But these days, I don't use Mate anymore. I use Cinnamon, which I'll get to that a little bit later. But you really gotta, you really gotta make sure you use your own, use your own stuff to the best of your ability to really get a sense for, for just how things work, how things can even break. Because that's only going to help when someone else thinks it's cool to perhaps use what you're using. You know, just just to even at least give it a try. And they may run into certain things that you may have run into before, and you can just help them out, you know, right then and there, instead of them having to spend too much time figuring things out. So, yeah, eat your own dog food if you can. So let's 
this slide here. Right. So this is starting to describe my describe my setup a little bit. So clearly, I'm I'm using FreeBSD here. Uh, you you could replace that with with Tux to symbolize Linux, but I didn't feel like I, I put I put a really old really old FreeBSD artwork. Uh, specifically about you know being able to turn machines into workstations because because that's that's how our machines are set up and so yeah FreeBSD is the actual operating system it's pretty nice you know it's, it's got a base system and all and uh, and yeah I run Cinnamon that's actually that, that's an actual picture of Cinnamon not the Cinnamon logo because because I'm dumb and uh, and, and yeah. That's actual cinnamon, not the cinnamon logo, because yeah, whatever. But cinnamon is that song by me. Yes, I do run. Uh, pretty much, pretty much did all the work, you know, updating it from what was in the free, well, well, what still is in the free BSD ports collection, version 2.4. We're now on version cinnamon version four, so I did pretty much all the work. It's almost done. There's some, there's some stuff that still needs to be fixed, but, but there's that. Um, so what we're going to get into now is kind of that kind of that experience you get. Well, experience that that someone who hasn't really used well maybe maybe has thought of using using like a Unix or a Linux desktop environment. How they may encounter for setting the damn thing up. So installation, you know, that could. That's going to probably include installing your operating system and then installing your installing your applications that aren't are, that are not necessarily part of the base system, right? The thing with installation, well, part of well, a huge part of the installation experience, at least on on, on the different uh, Unix or the BSD or the Linux variants, is that it's it's a bit of a hit or miss a lot of the time. So sometimes it can be it can just be really accurately smooth, but sometimes you know like some other times you know on certain other machines, it, it's just garbage. So so you know like the the original author of that 2019 blog post he he actually went into he went to like one and a half paragraphs worth of how he tried to get, initially get FreeBSD to run on his machine. I don't think he. Actually, yeah, he, he was using a ThinkPad X1, which should should have been should have been one of the better machines to, to to do things on, but apparently apparently at the end of the day, like he actually he bricked the thing, uh, for and he didn't really go into detail why, but you could really tell that he would, but he was just at the end of the day, he was he was just completely frustrated over the entire process, and that's unfortunately when you're when you really, when you have to support not just the desktop, but you're also like you're also a server operating system or some other, or or, not, or an operating system for another environment like the embedded environment. When you have to support them all, sometimes you know corner cases can get missed, and uh, certain sometimes the experience can just become a disaster, unfortunately. So that's like that's like if that's actually if you even get the person. To even do any sort of installation at all, because in the rest of the in the rest of the, like the in like the person well personal computer marketplace or like the or you know the, the laptop marketplace if you will, the vast majority of people like even even if they were even if they were told to like you know install install like you know a, a different a differently licensed version of Windows because work paid for it. They still wouldn't do it because, like, it, it, it doesn't matter how how polished, how you know, well crafted the user experience of an installer program is. People don't want to install operating systems. Period. So, so that's why. So that's why, like, you know, before I said, you know, that's that's even if you get the person to do any sort of installation at all, they may they may have a very very. Uh, different road depending on certain things. So that's installation. Priorities, on the other hand, that's that's a little bit on 
you know, that's a little bit on the on like kind of longer time developers of of a particular base system. So this is just a little a little excerpt. You, you, got, you guys don't have to read it, but it's just it's just a little screenshot and excerpt of of a uh, of an article that the that the original guy that the, the German guy actually linked on his blog of of getting OpenBSD to work on, on a laptop. And I want to specifically point out the the part might not be able to see it, but he's this um, this little extra piece specifically says something about you know the you can really tell that the OpenB that the core OpenBSD developers actually go through their stuff, like actually use it on a daily basis compared to certain other certain other Unix variety, which I which I'm positive he taken a jab at FreeBSD. And um, I, I do have to say that is partially true, um, particularly particularly due to how much commercial support uh, FreeBSD gets, you know, via its foundation and other means. You know, the, the money is not really coming into the desktop side of things. The, the money is really coming in for making sure that, making sure that the free BSD instances that run all of Netflix, uh, you know, don't break. You know, the, 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 the money is coming in for free BSD, free BSD instances that run Yahoo, you know, things like that. The money is not necessarily coming in, nor the manpower is coming in for desktops nearly to the same extent as for server applications, or even or even in the embedded space, you know, like there's, you know, on, on the FreeBSD mailing on the specifically the FreeBSD ARM mailing list, you know, and the and the RC channels, like you can tell that even in even in the embedded space, you have you've got like you've got people from Cavium, Marvel, even um, even NXP just like just just you know doing it for work, and so that. That's just money pouring. That, that's just more money pouring into a part of FreeBSD that's not desktop necessarily. So, so of course, in this case, you know, there might be some resentment, or even like, or even certain other fr FreeBSD developers who were tempted to try FreeBSD on that on the desktop were just like, nah, I just want to buy MacBook Pro and just run Mac OS on it, and then I'll just SSH into some FreeBSD instance on a cluster somewhere. And and that'll be that. I do remember. I do remember one one FreeBSD developer actually uses a MacBook Pro, but like he dual boots between macOS and FreeBSD. So it, so at least there's that. But it should be like at least at, at at a BSD conference, like we should probably see a little bit more people not using macOS specifically as a desktop. But there's also the thing about there's also the thing about just desktop desktop minimalism really just like just the look and feel of even a window manager or desktop environment and I have definitely found a lot of a lot of the more lower level in terms of like operating system stack that is developers they tend to prefer if they're going to have a desktop really at all they're they're going to be they're probably going to be some some sort of a tiled environment or or, or something that heavily that, that is like heavily configurable via text files or that or otherwise just look looks as terminally as or, or consolely as possible because these are orthogonal to the, I mean, the operating system right are these no they're are not these, are these things that just run on BSD so is it not running X I thought everything ran on the same platform no I mean it's like what, whether I'm using FreeBSD, yeah, yeah. OpenBSD, yeah, or some yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm just like, I run this. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm more like, you know, like, I probably should have made it a little bit more clear that it was like, you know, like all this could be applied to Linux as well. So it's like, so it's re it's really just that's why I said Unix, but, Linux, BSD, desktops, but it's like. But that's what the talk is about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what? But that point though, are the so is um. That tiling manager, is that the same on the Linux side? Yeah. Yeah, you can run that on Linux. Oh. It's just, it, that's i3, actually. That's a screen. Yeah, I must say I recognize it, so it's the same. Yeah, it's, the so. same. It's, it, it's, like, it's pretty much the exact same software between Linux and all the other uh, Unix varieties. Okay. You, know, you, 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 might, you might have to tweak certain parts of source code you know, just to make it compile properly or to run properly, but overall, it's the same stuff. Do they have, like, when you compile it, do they have like, targets for... 
Oh yeah, but it's like, but, but I mean, like when e even, but like, even though the triples may be different between the different uh, the different operating systems, like as long as it, as long as it's the same architecture, it's generally the same. It's generally the same stuff. Like like the source code is the same. Like it's really, it really has to be like very specific bits. Like for example, for example, like when I was working on working on porting Cinnamon over, uh, there there were certain there are certain lines in the Nemo file manager that use a lot of Linuxisms, specifically the, the the Unix kernel specific like unsigned integer types, which are like U is like U sixteen U eight, which the BSDs obviously don't have. So you have to so I had actually I had to manually convert those to explicitly the the C the, the C standard U int sixteen underscore T things like that. So. So it, 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 it's really it's really small stuff, if anything, that that allows it to compile or just run properly. Otherwise, it's the same stuff. But back back to this whole this whole minimalist minimal, minimalism stuff. You know, like this is actually common to both you know Linux Linux desktop users and BSD desktop users and and, and others. You know who. Who may use a tiling environment, a tiling manager, or or certain, or, or even a stacking manager that's not, that that doesn't necessarily look the most full featured. I say look the most full featured, not actually the most full featured, because there's clearly a difference in there. But even when you're even when you're showing showing someone who who is used to Mac OS, someone who someone who is used to the Mac OS Aqua environment, or even the Windows environment, and like. And you, you show them something like show them something like i3, they may just be in a huge culture shock. There, it's like, it's like, whoa, like, I can't, I can't just move my windows around like it, it, as freely as I can, like I can on Windows or Mac OS or or things like that. You know, there's that that kind of a larger culture shock may actually may actually drive certain people away, and. And so you have to. So for those who want a little bit more of this adoption, you have to think of it. There's also the, there's also the, the thing about pride here. So this is this is just a little screenshot from a section of, of free BSD manual, um, just ju just explaining BSD in general. And I really just got this particular part of it. It's like why is BSD not better known? And the first reason. The first reason probably says most of it, and and it really is it, it really is the fact that BSD people don't necessarily publicize things as much as Linux people do. You know, Linux Linux has its has its fanboys just like Mac OS has its fanboys. BSD people, yeah, like there, there may be a few, but like but when you really look at when you really look at the the overall pop like the user bases between them all, what I what I've definitely found is that besides besides the fact that BSD people don't necessarily publicize it nearly to the same annoying extent as some of the other systems. Okay, I want to take exception to that because if someone's running Unix, like half the time you don't know if they're running like, Arch or Ubuntu or whatever. But the free BSD people, they're they're like the people that are doing like. Um, like CrossFit, like you don't have to ask them if they're running FreeBSD. They're going to tell you they're running FreeBSD. Like, for example, the person giving the talk. <laughs> no, no, that's no, 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 not necessarily. No. Maybe there's some free BSD oh, no, boys. No, I, no, I, I would say. I can't imagine where they would be. I would, I would say that actually rings more true with the OpenBSD people, not FreeBSD. <laughs> OpenBSD is a little more guilty of that. Is, is there a, um... Does what, the what, have what, songs? Okay, I have another question. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. that's, that's also an OpenBSD. You just came to the music. I mean, I, mean, yeah. I mean, dog fooding is good up to a point, but, like, you have to have, like, you need, you need, you're not going to find all the bugs. You need a, a, an install base to help find the bugs. There's millions and millions of people running various Linux distributions, and the BSDs are so small, compared to everything else, that, okay, you can polish your code all you want, but I want to use the platform, just like, I, I, want, I don't want to drive, I don't want to drive, like, aside from the expense, I don't want to drive, like, a Lamborghini, because if something goes wrong with it, like, a, a Mercedes, right, and something goes wrong with it, the parts are going to be expensive, everything else, I mean, if I drive, like, a Ford or a Honda, 
Like everyone's trying to actually, understand what the problems are. Well, well, I actually wouldn't say that, but a lot of the embedded stuff out there, because of BSD's licensing, there's a lot more devices and things that actually run BSD. It's just not well known. Well, you know, and while one BSD user is worth 25 MacBook users. <laughs> <laughs> But that's kind of the culture thing. I, I do agree because, like, I remember, like, Arch people, right? Yeah. Arch lands. I mean, we, we, we probably, most of us have companies meet, we know who those guys are. Yeah. <laughs> there, you know what I mean? Whereas I, I'm assuming that in the BSD world, relative to things, we've got the open BSD fans, free BSD fans, and net BSD fans. Like, it, it seems like it'd be unavoidable. Like, no, no it, group is beyond. It's that. certainly, it, 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 it's certainly unavoidable. But when, but when you actually, when you're actually hanging around the mailing list, well, actually, probably the best way to to, to, to gauge it is, is 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 by going to conferences, actually. And at the BSD, at the one BSD conference that's being at, and. The other people who've gone to other BSD conferences, you know, people like it, it's it's been a pretty universal trend that for desktop stuff, you don't really you don't really see the level of BSD usage on the desktop as much as you see other platforms. And you're saying that because it's more obscure, you don't have the level. I wouldn't. Of have, I, more. I wouldn't necessarily say it's more obscure. It's just that it's just that I think you know the. The, like certain other BSD people go to conferences and such. Like they probably tried to run a desktop, try to run you know their 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 BSD as a desktop, and they just got annoyed with it really quickly. Like they, they probably just didn't have the patience to you know okay. to get it working correctly. They're just there for their PF sense or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit like like it, it's a little bit more of a pragmatic yeah. approach to things rather than that idealistic approach. Would you say between the two groups, there's the, the BSD folks collectively are more comfortable without the GUI as opposed to maybe with the Linux side where there's sort of this duality of people wanting to move away from other systems and they need the GUI as opposed to the quote unquote hardcore Linux people who are okay without it. They, it's, it's sort of mission bound. I need it, I don't need it, it doesn't matter. Is, is BSD more monolithic in that? Most people don't run GUIs. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily go that far. I mean, I, I mean, you you could go there to an extent, but I think it's really. I I think it, it really just goes back to just best tool for the job, as long as it doesn't annoy me too much. Oh. So, and, and the and what annoyance, the applications are there that you need. Well, that, but but, yeah. but even but even just setting up the desktop in general, right, is is is. Can be a beast in itself, you know. Very, very unlike setting up a server or setting up an embedded system. It, it, it's like, yeah, it, it, it's not really comparable in in experience, in experience factor. So, is free, FreeBSD runs X, right? Or they all run X. Huh? They all run X. This is all X Windows. Just standard yeah, X Windows. Yeah, okay. it's all it, yeah, it's all X. So, yeah. So yeah. So this. So. The, uh, the the German guy later posted on his Mastodon account, which is just which is kind of like distributed Twitter, if you will. That that um so th th this was right when he he bricked his X one his his uh, ThinkPad X one, and he was like, "Where's my Windows ninety five floppy disk?" Set? Like he, he he was just that sick of the experience, and that is actually that is not uncommon. That that, that is not uncommon even for even for people who. Trying out Linux desktops for the first time, mm -hmm. let alone BSD desktops. Like just, just setting, just like installing it, trying to set it up. You know, compared to just getting a machine with it pre-installed. Well, why is it? Why is it so much more difficult? I mean, driver support. Yeah. Driver support. Yeah, really. Okay. Yeah. yeah really. Driver support. Things crashing on you. <laughs> kernel panics. Rewind Linux. 12 years. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Yeah. No, I was about to say it's X because, I mean, X has matured quite a bit since then. I mean, a lot of the ways we run X in Linux now, you don't have to get, you don't even have oh, to yeah. go into X. It's the, same, it's the same way with BSD. Like, it, it, we're, we're using the exact same version. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. I understand, like, why can't, I mean, has anyone tried to port, like, say, KDE over, which I know we probably know because that's, that's a pretty... People use KDE. 
People use KDE on free on oh. the BSDs on a daily basis. Huh. Okay. So, but is that difficult? I mean, that it's it it, it, it it's really it's really at that lower level. Okay. It's really at the at the lower level of the stack where like where people are just trying to boot the machine at all, trying to trying to make sure that they're that they're using the current video driver instead of just using the EFI frame buffer. Okay. Uh, like stuff like that. You know, get, getting getting the speakers to work, getting the microphone to work. Aren't these things like well known? Like, is there a wiki? like as a new user, is there a wiki or something I can go to? to yeah, there's a wiki. Like, yeah. I mean, like most of the, most of the BSDs like document it well, but like, but you do have certain users who don't like to read documentation, or it's like, or feel like they're too good for the documentation. Right. But I mean, but that aside. It exists, so there's a wiki. If I want to install a GUI on yeah. BSD, yeah. there's documentation. Out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's all there. It, it's it, it's again like it, it's just the like, it's more of those lesser expected problems. It's like like problems that you probably wouldn't necessarily see in the documentation. Problems that that may or may not be covered in an FAQ. So, yeah, you know, it, it, it's it's quote unquote. But yeah, in, in, in this case, you know, like this this guy was clearly not having a good, not having a good experience, you know, especially with this driver support. Uh, so, on on cinnamon. So this is this was when I first actually, when I first posted to Twitter that like cinnamon four. This is the first successful run of cinnamon four on FreeBSD, and uh, and you know just first run it works. Uh, most of it works, like you know, like because pretty much the only, pretty much like the way I, I had to do it was was run the entire uh, desktop environment all at once. So like the 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 the, the um the task the the task bars, you know the the all the other all the other programs, you know the the system tray, the control center, all that good stuff. You know, really had to just run it all at once to to really get a feel for it if it's going to. If it's going to be usable or not, and it turns out, turns out even on the first run, it was mostly usable. Although, uh, although I did mention that sound support at the time was a little bit dodgy, which uh, which I figured out it had nothing to do with the sound support at all. It was something. It was something else, which which I will cover uh, in I think a couple more slides. But but yeah. So th this was this is the first like me first publicizing that 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 updated cinnamon actually runs. And work was done to port it, and yeah, other other people noticed. You know, the I got I got one response that he's like, yeah, I love I, I love using cinnamon. You know, like it really like it really you know shows you the most important parts of, of you know of an operating system. You can configure it, but it also hides some of the other other stuff. You know, so th this guy clearly likes using cinnamon, and then I get this other guy. I I talked with this guy in IRC a few times. And I saw him on the mail list, and he was like, "Yeah, like cinnamon is literally the only thing preventing me from using FreeBSD as a daily driver on the desktop." Hmm. So that kind of a, so like I think this guy actually motivated me a little, a quite quite a bit more than the other guy. Although that that other guy was uh, that other guy was pretty cool too. But but, but really, like when, when you hear stuff like when you hear stuff like you know, this is literally the missing link from me actually using this as a daily driver. That is like you can't get any better than that. And then, uh, and then, so I was tracking. I was tracking the progress and the and like sending some of the commits to. Well, we have a GNOME team in in, in the FreeBSD Porsche collection, which does GNOME and GTK related stuff, which Cinnamon and obviously GTK. So I was, so I was putting in all my commits in a pull request there. Someone someone actually just commented just like a couple of days ago, just like. Just wanted to see what what the progress was because because I guess he was excited too. In fact, I think he said I resurrected my X two seventy for this. So yeah, people people like people like using cinnamon. You know the actually I should probably go back go back to this guy. So this guy this guy at first did not actually try to install vanilla free BSD. He tried to install TrueOS and Project Triton, which are just um, downstream. Forkish things of FreeBSD, like mostly for well, optimized for desktop. At, at least that's what's in the tin. Mm -hmm. But th this guy, like he, but the the downstream forkish desktop things, they they come with a different. Well, it, it's still X, but it comes with a different desktop environment called um, called 
fuck, I forget the name. It, it, it's, some, it, it's some cute based thing, Lumina. It comes with Lumina, which, which, was, which is a BSD native one, so it doesn't use DBus or anything like that. And, um, but apparently, apparently there, I, I haven't really seen much feedback, positive or negative, about Lumina, so I can't say anything about it. Although I can definitely say that people really like, really like Cinnamon, whether they use Linux Mint or some other Linux distribution where they were able to install Cinnamon or whatever. And then, and then there, there's a little bit of making of, making of Cinnamon on FreeBSD. So this, one, so this, act, this was just me commenting about it. I was like, yeah, like that, that doggy sound support or, or something like that. Yeah, that was just pilot error. Apparently, uh, apparently what happened was it was trying to dereference a null pointer. Um, to to the login D session and login D doesn't exist on free B on any of the BSDs, but there is an option to use console kit, but the console kit option at the time was not default, was not switched on. So of course when it tries to dereference null pointer, the whole the whole session crashes. So pilot error solved. And then this other one was this other one which I'm still trying to figure out, which is if you try to unlock the screensaver, um, if you, even if you type in the correct password, it still says it's wrong. Uh, that, that may just be a compatibility issue between Linux PAM and Open PAM, which Rich, I think, uh, Rich, I think requested to talk about PAM at some point, right? Uh, but yeah, so that's, I think that's, I think that password unlock thing is just going to be the last uh, showstopper right now before, before it makes it into the, into the port tree itself. So and then and then the tour well we don't really need a tour so. Not good tour. So you running BSD on that laptop? Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm going to a car dealership and just look at the cars. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. So that's uh, so this here. So as we can see, this is this is the um, so cinnamon. I think as of like version three point six or eight. Um, they, they, they start to include this thing called X apps, which are basically the like the cinnamon forked uh, versions of like G edit and like I have GNOME and things like like but like, 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 like basically like the GNOME like utility programs and like and niceties except like cinnamon forked it for for themselves and they developed a, developed a shared library to kind of unite them all. So, so this is so this is the PDF reader um, that that you guys were looking at for the, for the whole talk. Um, this screen resolution is very very small. Um, I'm gonna try my best here. Well, I can't really I can't really show you the menu because it's on the other screen. Um, I can't show you Nemo. Nemo is Nemo is basically just the it's just the fort file um, browser from. From you know, which is not tell us, you know, the yeah, the <coughs> Nemo. Uh, I'll probably show you the probably show you the system settings. Well, the, well, the the screen is the screen resolution is small, but you guys can be I think that's control center. I mean, there's not. I mean. I mean, there's not there's not all that much to show. It's like if if, if anyone's used to what you know to looks and feels like, or, or what's, or what a GNOME 3 look and feels like. It's kind of like a cross between what was GNOME 2 with like the transparency and like kind of the high display uh, pixel density support and like some of the other, uh, some of the other graphical effects of GTK 3, so. That's, that's cinema you're referring to. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So yeah, Cinema was actually forked from GNOME three, like early on, because because GNOME three, like back when it was new, like people absolutely hated it because it was so it was so like radically different than anything else, and and so the the, the Cinema people and and so and other desktop Linux users were like, yeah, like we that's a little bit too much of a change. Let's like let let's you know do do something a little more conservative while kind of keeping the newer visual styling, if you will. So. And obviously the dual, like, you've, you're extending your monitor, so yeah. things like that, because that's that's really based in X. That's not necessarily the 
the um, Windows? Some of, some of it is actually dependent on the desktop okay. in, in a way. So back when I was using Mate, um, you know, stuff like the, stuff like the, you know, switching monitors and even monitor detection, it actually did not work. Whereas in Cinnamon, even back when I was on Linux, only Cinnamon actually did it properly. Hmm. So, so be, primarily because Cinnamon, I think, has a, has its own little background process to actually detect monitors um, when you like open and close the lid and things like that. Whereas Mate and some of the other ones don't. So. Hmm. Anyone else? Are you gonna sing? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Open, OpenB, I don't think OpenBSD has actually released a song for for this past version, so. Well, well it, it is, well, yeah. What's your experience been like with the, um, the course tree for package management? I was looking into um, installing it, and I was sort of intimidated about the whole ports thing. So, yeah, so ports are, so ports are basically just category, so, they're they're essentially just glorified make files that will okay. fetch fetch you know like the source code you know install all, all the dependencies or build all the dependencies and then actually build the software um, you know like using the ports tree like kind of verbatim yes it can be a little bit intimidating that's why at least in the FreeBSD land we have other tools to kind of help you use it a little bit more effectively so there's the, there's one in particular that the that um, Free, that like the FreeBSD ports, port managers themselves use called Pudrier, and that's that was originally a ports like a ports testing framework, but it ended up becoming like the de facto, um, you know, ports bulk builder for even their official package repositories, and um, it's and I think that's really that that actually made the experience a whole lot better because you can actually you can specify all the all, all like the application ports like just in one file and then if you just pass that one file in as the bulk input you know it will actually scan for all the dependencies and, and so you don't have to specify them all. Use ports, just use Gen 2. It's not I'm, the same. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah Gen, Gen 2's portage was actually inspired by the BSD ports system. So. You can still have the brain dead directory pens. FHS. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we we have our own we have our own hierarchy man page. You would have to. You know, like I was trying to get people to change. It's like, you know, their cache is probably more more appropriate than user portage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right.